great summer too. Hi, St. Paul friends. This is Jerry and Julie Paisley from Friendswood, Texas. Greetings, St. Paul's. This is a spot we like to come and do some running, biking, some fishing, feed the ducks and turtles. We really enjoy it down here. Miss you all. Hope all of you are staying safe, safe and healthy. And someday we'll get to come back and see all of you. Take care. Goodbye. Dear members at St. Paul, blessings to you all. Colleen and I, as well as our family, often reflect on the marvelous years spent in Clinton among the people of St. Paul's. Our years among you seemed extraordinarily productive, and unless I am mistaken, the momentum of those years are continuing to energize your ministry, even today in new chapters that are now being written. I'm grateful for the opportunity for growth for our family that we enjoyed among you, building a strong foundation for my own ministry that has opened opportunities for leadership and service within the ELCA. How wonderful in these days of viral challenge there is the body of Christ, like the people of God at St. Paul, continuing to offer love and support, fruits of faithfulness of the gospel of Christ. And so, blessings to you all from Michael, Colleen, Gretchen, Andrew, Megan, and Joseph, the last family. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Clark Olson Smith. This is St. Paul Lutheran Church in Clinton, Iowa. It is a gift to worship God together. We are together in spirit, if not in person. Uh, so I want to thank you for your continued generosity uh, and ask you um, to pray for um, the Southeastern Iowa Synod. St. Paul Lutheran Church is part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and this region is the Southeastern Iowa Synod. It goes from uh, here uh, down to Burlington, over to Des Moines, and just a little beyond. Uh, it, uh, we are gathering online uh, in the coming weeks uh, to uh, elect a new bishop and to do other uh, business. So uh, please pray for those who are preparing um, to uh, participate in that election, who are preparing uh, to provide uh, the Synod with a, uh, a safe and online uh, experience of assembly. And, uh, and also um, pray for St. Paul as we prepare to return to in-person worship. Uh, that will begin uh, on the 23rd of August, August 23rd, Sunday. At 9.15, our usual time, uh, we will begin with a brief worship uh, with communion. Uh, so expect um, to, to not sing, uh, to be socially distant, uh, bring your masks, they'll be required, we'll have masks on hand. Uh, we will use all of our entrances uh, so if you are able, please uh, uh, go around the sides and even to the front, uh, the old front uh, main entrance. Uh, but there will be greeters outside to help direct your way, and we will work it out together. So I appreciate your patience. Uh, I also invite you to keep those in mind who um, will not be joining us in in-person worship. Uh, they will still have access to the live stream, but... Um, will not be fed in the same way that those of us who gather in person will. Um, Jesus will hear Jesus today uh, in the feeding of the 5,000. Say, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. All of those St. Paul people who will be uh, still remaining distant and not participating in in-person worship. You, people of God, give them something to eat.
kids, say St. Paul kids. Um, so today I want to talk about the margins. Margins. Let me show you what a margin is. Here's a book. A margin, you see everywhere there's writing on the page. The margins are the, the, the part of the page where there's nothing written. You might say the margins are empty. <clears throat> They're at the side, at least, and this, the text, the words, are all in the middle. Now, we could talk about the margins of other things, other than books. Uh, you could say that, talk about the margins of maybe your playground at school, um, and notice who's there. If someone's getting left out of a game, they're at the margins, and everyone who is playing is at the center. Um, but how about this? This might be a little trickier. Let's talk about the margins of society or the margins of the, the, the place we live in. Hmm, the margins. So here's one way to think about margins. Um, if somebody is really sick or really hurt, they might go to the hospital. And if you've ever visited anyone in the hospital, you know that sometimes you have to go to the hospital, not in Clinton, but in Davenport, or the hospital in Iowa City. Or if you or your family are going shopping, sometimes you might not go shopping in Clinton. You might go to Davenport or Iowa City. There's ways that Clinton is on the margins. Um, and the center are places like Davenport or Iowa City or Des Moines. Um, Clinton used to be the center or a center, you know, like, like a couple of hundred years ago. There were more millionaires in Clinton uh, per capita, that means per the population, than anywhere else in the world. And so everyone came shopping here. You can see in the big courthouse that's downtown, uh, this used to be the center, but now it's more on the margins. Now, Jesus spent his time working with people on the margins. You know, these are people who maybe rented their houses instead of owned their houses. Uh, these are the people who lived in the neighborhoods where the streets weren't kept up as well. You know, it had been a long time since the street was resurfaced or the sidewalks were redone. Um, they might live in a part of town where the, the parks um, uh, have, have less going on in the parks. The parks are nicer in the centers. It's not necessarily the geographical center, but just where the center of the uh, people with money and power are. Jesus you know, we see Jesus to this week on the margins for sure. He's in a deserted place, uh, a desert, a wilderness. He's going there to, to lie low for a little while. But people who are on the margins come and find him. They're people who are sick and people who are hungry, uh, people who, who don't get as much say about how, the, how their world is working. Jesus heals them. Jesus feeds them, and it's food that comes from God and healing that comes from God and not from the center of their world. Jesus is always working on the margins and helping our um, world become more fair so that what's at the center is also present at the margins, that we can be in it together. And also inviting us to be um, aware of the margins in our own selves and not to hate them and not to try to run away and notice how even in the world around us we might be trying to run away from the margins and get to the center where all of the good stuff is but invest in the margins because those places that other people might overlook or look down on are in fact the places that are at the very center of what God is doing. 
and the good things that God is bringing into the world. <clears throat> so you can give thanks for that, even though you're at the, at the mar you might be at the margins, or even if you're at the center, Jesus is finding a way to connect with you and to make the, the world a safer, more fair place. Amen. All right, let's share some peace. Put your arms out. The peace of Christ be with you always. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit. And with this food, Fill all the starving world through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1 to 5. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Here ends the reading. The second reading is from Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscious conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong... <clears throat> To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Here ends the reading. The Gospel according to Matthew. At that time, Herod the ruler heard reports about Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. Because Herod had arrested John, bound him, and put him into prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been telling him, it's not lawful for you to have her. And although Herod wanted to put John to death, he feared the crowd, because they regarded John as a prophet. But... When Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company, and she pleased Herod so much that he promised on oath to grant her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head on John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison, and the head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, who brought it to her mother. John's disciples came and took the body and buried it, and then they went and told Jesus. Now, when Jesus heard this, 
he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed Jesus on foot from the towns. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to Jesus and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they might go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, Bring them here to me. Then Jesus ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, plus many more women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Now the Gospel of Matthew offers a stark choice, Herod or Jesus. The Gospel compares them simply by setting these two stories side by side. A feast in a palace that ends in the killing of God's messenger, his head on a serving plate, and an empty desert on the margins, full of sick and hungry people, that ends in healed bodies and full stomachs and students of a new way getting to play a part in that miracle. Death spills out of the palace, life overflows in the desert. And Isaiah calls to us, why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Matthew wants us to see in Jesus the new Moses, Herod and later Pilate, who stand in for the whole Roman imperial system. They play the part of Pharaoh. This is a new liberation in the desert. The healed bodies and full stomachs have a greater purpose, just like manna in the wilderness. They are fuel for walking the freedom highway. Jesus made a way out of the oppressive and violent regime of Rome that Rome's supporters called peace and civilization and law and order. The kingdom of heaven came near. The promise of the prophets and the Psalms made real. The Lord who upholds all those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. You open wide your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. And from last week, rescue me from those who oppress me, and I will keep your commandments. Jesus was on a rescue mission, still is, saving us from leaders and systems that are the reason why sick people are sick, and hungry people are hungry, and God's faithful are in danger. Those with ears to hear, listen. In his letter to the Romans, Paul spoke of his great sorrow and unceasing anguish. His own people, his nation, chose the new Pharaoh over the new Moses. When Paul assured the church, I am speaking the truth in Christ, it is a warning to us. There is no losing the gifts God has already given, but we can choose not to participate in the next new thing God is doing, the new liberation. Past performance is no promise of future results. 
That's the warning we can take away from Paul's words in Romans. Will we be more loyal to the Herods of this world than to Jesus? Will we feast in the palace or be fed in the wilderness? What must we lose and what will we gain? The lover's quarrel between Jesus and the Pharisees, scribes, and temple leaders was over this essential loyalty. They had the ear of Herod and Pilate, but not the heart of God. They blessed the oppression as God's own will. Some feasted because the rest starved, and the many starved because some feasted. But God heard the people's cry, even if the pastors and bishops and CEOs of Christian schools and publishing houses and all the well-meaning church people ignored it. In every new era, God's people get to clear our ears and check our allegiances and hear again the word of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, because they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, because they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of justice, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, because your reward is great in heaven, because in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. Did Jesus say, blessed are the Christians? No. Salt doesn't need a label to be salty. In fact, Jesus, if Jesus' parables are any guide, salt works best when it's hidden. So be careful. Many mask dominance with righteousness. There is no room for domination in the kingdom of heaven. Power over cannot seize control of the kingdom, not this kingdom. The power with of Christ's cross is too strong because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Even as Jesus went into hiding to find rest and respite from bloody Herod, we see his strength. He did not lose his compassion. Do not let your fear steal your compassion either. Real strength suffers with in love. Beware the feasts this world promises. They cannot satisfy, but only make us slaves to an anxious drive for more, more, more. If the food we eat and the blessings we celebrate put us to sleep to human-made pandemics and poverty, then they are not from God. The bread of heaven is a wake-up call. It fills the belly with fire. You give them something to eat, Jesus insisted, as if warning that salvation will never be found in the imperial marketplace, in imperial colonies, at the centers of power. The bread of heaven is at the margins, hidden in the places the market does not value 
and the empire overlooks. Where can we go for this bread? We don't have to go anywhere. Our souls are already waiting for us. Heaven is within you. The heaven within us is food for the journey of making heaven on earth for all to enjoy. Sit down in the grass, your soul whispers. Stop pining for the palace. Leave the throne to Herod. Here is the true feast. Here is the true king. Be healed now, even here from the cross. Life gushes forth. Thanks be to God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from age to age. Now, trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. So by your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. 
beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let's now live in hope, because hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. You take resources that appear to be meager, bless them, and there is enough. May your church trust that what you bless and ask us to share with the world is abundantly sufficient. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your bountiful creation offers sustenance and life for all creatures. Protect this abundance for the well-being of all. Reverse the damage we have caused your creation. Replenish groundwater supplies. Provide needed rains in places of drought. And protect forests from wildfires. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer yourself to all the nations and peoples of the earth inviting everyone to abundant life. Bring the prophetic vision to fulfillment that all nations will run to you and that nations that do not know you will find their joy in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Hear the anguish of tender hearts who cry to you in suffering and satisfy their deepest needs. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body, heart, soul, and mind. For Max, Jackie, Kelly, Kevin, Vince, Diane, Dale, Gail, Lisa, Nancy, Pauline, David, Rick, Margaret, Mary, Doug, Dorothy, Gary, Donna, Fern, Lois, Judy, Peyton, Carolyn, David, Carla, Kathleen, Kayla, Jeremy, Jordan, Joshua. For the homebound, Darlene, Jean, Irene, Sherry. For those in care facilities, Edith, Betty, Marion, Bob, Joan, Evelyn, Jean, Marge, and Peggy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer freely the fullness of salvation. Give our congregation, St. Paul, such a welcoming heart that our words and actions may extend your free and abundant hospitality to all whom we encounter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You gather your saints as one united in the body of Jesus. Bring us with all your saints to the heavenly banquet. We remember with love and thanksgiving the saints we have known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil, because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace. Christ is with you.